So today we talk about the master budget. This is the uber budget on which everything is planned. Virtually everything we've done so far has been retrospective in nature. How did we do from time one to time two? But from a business standpoint, we of course need to be able to look ahead to plan our purchasing and our production and the like. So our master budget allows us to map out the way we think things are going to go. When we're done with it, we can produce a set of financial statements that'll show us where we're going to be at the end of the period. And we can look at that and say, gosh, is that where I want to be or not where I want to be? And if it's not where we want to be, then we need to go in and see where we can make changes to help us achieve our goals. So now, why are we doing this? What sorts of questions can we answer? Well, first of all, given our projected sales, how much do we need to purchase or produce in order to meet those targets? Sales predictions are well beyond the scope of this class, so we'll just treat them as given. But of course, we want to be able to meet our customers' needs, and that means having sufficient supply of goods or services to deliver to them when they want it. We can look at our cash position at various points in the future, budgeting not just purchases and such, but payments and cash receipts. And we can look out ahead and see that here or there we might be running low on cash. It's better to negotiate a line of credit with a bank now rather than when we find ourselves short and have to go begging. We're likely to get a much better deal now. So the budget is a multiple step process, but it's all very linear. The results of step one will feed into the planning of the next step and so on. It starts with our sales forecast, and if we know that we're going to sell X in January, that's going to tell us how much we need to produce in order to meet those demands. And then, our production needs will drive our purchasing of inputs. We need to make sure that we've got sufficient raw materials on hand, and we need to make sure we've got the proper amount of labor resources. Do we need to hire? Do we need to lay off? So now that we've got all the production planned, we can look at the back end and plan out our cash receipts and our cash disbursements. Given our expected sales and our prior collection history, how much cash will be coming into our accounts and when? And given the credit terms we've established with our own vendors, when will we be writing checks for how much? When we combine the information of receipts and disbursements, we can see how we're going to be standing and with regard to cash at each step along the way. Do we need to make short-term borrowing or are we going to be okay? And once we've done this, we can now create our pro forma financial statements. Up here, we've got our sales and costs of goods sold. Here, we've got our inventory, and here. Here, we've got our receivables and payables. And in here, we've got our other expenses. And then we can roll forward the equity and the long-term assets and liabilities. All of these items will flow into those financial statements, given this set of assumptions, and then we can look at them and ask ourselves if we're happy. And if we're not, then we go back and tweak the things that can be tweaked. So let's get started. Step one, there's our sales forecast. Again, we're going to assume that this is what our sales are going to look like over the coming quarter. Dave Corp is planning out the coming quarter for its donut hole production operations. You'll note that we're forecasting out beyond the coming quarter, and this is because we can't just act in a vacuum for the current period. The decisions we make this quarter will affect and be affected by our needs out in April and May. So I've got them included here. So here's how we're predicting things to be. We know that for New Year's resolutions, everyone cuts down on the crap that they have in their diets, so we expect a significant slowdown in sales. However, we plan on having a big media push in February to drive sales. It's what's inside that counts for Valentine's Day. And if you think about it, it works on so many levels. It's what's inside, so we don't care if you're a big fatty. Not only that, but our donut holes are filled, and as one of my former students pointed out, the donut hole is the inside. Ah very deep. The upshot is that we expect weak demand here, an uptick here, and then we settle into a consistent demand going forward through the next quarter. I just came up with a silly story to give us a wacky series of numbers to budget around to make it interesting. So we've got our sales budget. What does this lead us to? For us to have donut holes to sell, we need to have donut holes produced. And in order for us to produce donut holes, we need to make sure that we have sufficient raw material and labor scheduled to run the machines. We're going to have a production level that's higher than we've historically had, so maybe this means we need to buy new capital assets to meet that higher demand. So let's start with production. We make premium donut holes, so we can't mass produce them and store them in a warehouse until they're ready to be sold. So we plan on having about two days worth of sales at any particular point in time. So when we get to January 1st, we've got some stuff already on hand. 
So our December 31st inventory will be based on what we expect to sell in January. Our January ending inventory will be based on February's sales, and so on. So, if we expect to sell 30,000 donut holes in January, and our target is 5%, we would expect to have 1,500 donut holes in stock on January 1st. So we can take that down to our production budget, which will then take into account monthly sales needs as well as ending inventory needs and beginning inventory on hand to determine how much we should be producing in any given month. In January, we're going to be selling 30,000 units, and we're going to want to have 5% of February's 140,000 units on hand as ending inventory, since that's when we start the media blitz. That's 7,000 units, which means we need to have available 37,000 donut holes during the month of January. The 30,000 that we need to sell, plus the 7,000 we want to have on hand at the end of the month. We just calculated that we're going to start the month with 1,500 units on hand, which means that we need to produce 35,500 donut holes in January to meet our sales needs. This will, of course, carry forward into February. This 140 told us 7,000, so this 70 is going to tell us 3,500 ending units. We need to have a total of 143,500 units available during February, but we're going to end January with 7,000 units on hand, so our production for February is going to be only 136,500. And so we see right here off the bat that our budget has saved us quite a bit of grief, because if we hadn't done our production budget, what would we have done? We would have said, we're going to sell 30,000, let's make 30,000, and we would have found ourselves short of product at the beginning of February. We wouldn't have had sufficient product on hand to meet demand for those first couple of days. And then we would have looked at February and said, we're going to sell 140,000, let's produce 140,000. And then we would have produced too much in February, possibly resulting in spoilage because the demand just wasn't there in March. And then we can continue this into March and into April. We need to budget our April production since that'll drive our raw materials purchases in March. Feel free to stop the recording now to copy down the remaining numbers, and then restart it when you are ready, making sure that you understand where all the numbers are coming from. So now we know what we need to make. How do we make sure that we have sufficient raw material inventory and labor to get there? Each of our donut holes requires 3 ounces of flour, 1 ounce of sugar, and 1 ounce of sprinkles, which cost us 1 penny, 2 pennies, and 1 penny per ounce, respectively. Flour and sugar are standard products, and we've got a number of potential suppliers handy, so to minimize warehousing costs, we only try to keep on hand 10% of expected production for those two items. Our sprinkles, on the other hand, are these fancy gourmet sprinkles from overseas, and because the ships pass through pirate-infested waters, it's possible that our supply may become temporarily disrupted, so we like to keep 30% of those on hand. Silly, yes I know, but it lets us fiddle with the numbers some more. So we look at our flour and our sugar, which need a 10% beginning inventory each month, and we identify how many donut holes worth of raw material we need. Our February production is 136,500 units. This came from above. We just calculated that. Which means that we're going to want to have on hand, at the end of January, enough flour and sugar to produce 10% of that, or 13,650. We also plan on producing 35,500 donut holes during the month of January, meaning we need to have enough supplies to make a total of 49,150 units. But we can expect to have an opening inventory of 10% of January's production, or 3,550 units on hand. So, it appears that we need to produce enough flour and sugar to produce 45,600 donut holes in January. This month's ending inventory becomes next month's beginning inventory. This drives that, and we repeat the process. You can fill in the rest of the quarter following the same pattern. We've dropped May from our budget, since we only needed May long enough to calculate the 75,000 units right here to allow us to come up with our ending inventory in March. Feel free to copy those at your leisure. We do the same thing with the sprinkles, except now our target is 30% instead of 10%. So this is going to change what we need as ending inventory each month, and that will ultimately flow into each month's purchases. 
So we're going to want to have 40,950 donut holes worth of sprinkles as an ending inventory in January instead of the 13,650 of flour and sugar. Other than that 30% change, everything else in this worksheet is going to be the same. All we want to know is how many donut holes worth of raw materials do we need to purchase. Again, feel free to work through the worksheet and then continue the recording. Having that information, we can now calculate the dollar value of what it is we're going to be buying. We know from above that in January we need to purchase 45,600 donut holes worth of flour and sugar. We need 3 ounces of flour and 1 of sugar, so that means we're buying 136,800 ounces of flour and 45,600 ounces of sugar. Flour costs us a penny an ounce, so we're going to buy $1,368 worth of flour, and sugar costs us two pennies an ounce, so that's $912. For sprinkles, we had a higher purchase expectation, but only a penny an ounce, so that's going to yield $658 down here. What this means is that we're going to be buying a total of $29.38 of raw materials from our suppliers in January. We repeat the process in February and March, and we've now got our purchases taken care of. Labor is an input just like materials, and we can budget for that as well. Given how many donut holes we can make with an hour of labor, and given how many we need to produce in each of these months, we can budget our labor. At 200 donut holes per hour, we need 177.5 hours of labor in January. The 177.5 doesn't seem like a lot, so let's just go global and say that all figures are in millions to make us feel a bit better about Dave Corp. We should include our payroll taxes and benefits in this rate down here, which comes to a whopping 9 bucks an hour. Oof. That's some mighty cheap labor we got there. Anyway, that'll turn into about $1,600 in labor costs in January. We double up the shifts in February to meet the short-term production goal, giving us 682 hours or so, and about $6,100 in labor costs, and then we'll schedule about 350 hours in March for about $3,200 a cost. Now, if you remember all the way back to last class, you'll remember that we have more than just direct costs to worry about. We've got that overhead stuff for product cost, and the firm is going to have a host of period costs as well, such as backroom salaries and the like. Right now, we're not costing inventory. For our budget, we're taking a much more holistic approach, and we're looking at all the costs we're going to be facing during the upcoming months, product and period. So, we've got our variable overhead, which I believe last week we determined was two cents per unit, and that's going to give us product overhead for each month. 710 bucks in January, for instance, and 2730 in February. And then we've got all of the other fixed costs that we face. Our depreciation, our sales costs, our back office costs, and the like, which total to $6,500 in January. And when we add it to our variable overhead, we find ourselves facing $7,210 of total costs, of which 5210 are going to require cash payments. This depreciation right here is a non-cash expense, so it's important we recognize that when we move to our cash budget. Notice something about the depreciation line. Starting here in February, it's going to increase from 2000 to 3000 Remember how we talked about the relevant range, the band of production in which fixed costs are truly fixed? It looks like, to meet the higher expected demand, we're going to be buying new machinery, so our fixed costs have now increased a little bit. And here's the rest of the quarter. We see that asset acquisition on our next page. We're buying a new donut hole machine, which costs us $60,000. We're going to buy it in January and put it into service in February. We plan on splitting the payments up between January and March, but the payment terms don't have any effect on when we start depreciating it, and that's when we put it into service here in February. Now, as I said, if we have a history we can point to, we've got the ability to predict the cash collections that'll come from our sales. We've got an expectation that 70% of the sales we make will be collected in cash in the month that we make them. These include our cash customers, who buy them at our retail outlets, and some of our credit customers, who pay us quickly. The remaining 30% gets collected in the month following the sale, as the checks come in from some of our credit customers. So if we had $60,000 of sales back in December, we can expect that the remaining 30% of that cash from then will be coming in during January, so we'll fill it in here. Now from our sales budget, we know that our sales in January is going to be $15,000, and if we expect to collect 70% of that in cash, we're looking at $10,500 of cash coming in. 
So in total for the month of January, we can expect $28,500 of cash collections. The remaining 30% of January sales get collected in February, so we've got 4500 there, plus 70% of our February sales, which gives us $49,000 more, and we have $53,500 of cash receipts in February. This continues into March with 30% here and 70% here, and then the remaining 30% from March will be collected in the following quarter. Now we know what our cash collections look like over the next several months. We can do the same thing with our cash payments if we'd like, and your assignment will have you do so, but for the sake of expediency, we'll just assume that we pay for all of our purchases in the same month as the order, and we'll leave it at that. So now we've got everything we need to do for our cash budget for the upcoming quarter. This is a very valuable tool for us, since we can now see where we're going to stand as we move through the quarter. Stop the recording and try to create the cash budget on your own, at least for the month of January. Then restart the lecture. Our cash receipts budget says that we're going to receive $28,500 from customers during January, which, when added to our arbitrary beginning balance of $3,000, gives us $31,500 of cash available to us to spend during that month. Now let's look at our expenditures and see where we stand. Our labor budget gave us an expected labor cost of $15.98. Our overhead budget told us that we faced fixed costs to be paid with cash of $52.10. This is why we pulled that depreciation out. We have to put that down payment on the new donut hole machine for $30,000. And all the cost of the raw materials we're purchasing during the month is $29.38. So when we sum all this stuff up, we discover, oops, we're about $8,000 in the red from a cash standpoint. This is clearly not a good thing. Now it seems clear that the deficit is coming up here from the capital acquisition. So one possible solution would be to see if we could defer that payment until February. But let's assume that we already tried that and the seller won't budge. Now what? Well, we know that we need that machine to meet our growth target, so the next step would be to borrow from the bank. For the sake of mathematical simplicity, let's borrow in even $1,000 increments. And let's also assume that with our expected growth, we now want to keep at least $5,000 in the bank at all times, up from the $3,000 where we ended last year. So it looks like we need to borrow $14,000 from the bank. Again, for mathematical simplicity, let's assume we borrow it on January 31st. If we do so, we'll end the month with some debt, but we'll have cash on hand of $57.55, and we can now pay all of our bills. So here we see the value of this cash budget. We know going into January that we're going to be facing a shortfall, so this would be a good time to sit down with the bank and make sure that we've got a line of credit available. It's much better to do this now than wait to the last minute and hope that we can find someone to lend us that money. Let's look forward to February and see if things get any better. They ought to, since we're racking up all those sales and we don't have to worry about fixed asset purchases. Our 5755 of ending cash is of course going to come up here to our beginning balance. And then the cash receipts budget tells us to look forward to cash collections of 53500 bucks. So that gives us a little bit more than $59,000 of cash on hand with which to pay our bills. Those bills come from the same schedules as before, and we discover quite happily that we're up over $38,000 in the positive at the end of February. So let's repay that loan. The $14,000 comes out of cash, and we've had their cash for a month at 1% interest, so we'll pay them an additional $140, leaving us about $24,000 in cash at the end of February. This would be part of what we'd show the bank when we went to borrow, making them aware that our forecasts show them getting their money back safe and sound. And then we can do the same thing for March. So now that we're finished with our budget, we can now turn to our financial statements, which we'll start doing on the next page. We'll come back to that rolling budget thing in a few. I've got in your notes the 1231 balance sheet, which, in addition to our budget, is all we need to create our financial statements. Where do we find the information we need? Our cash comes from the cash budget. Our receivables can come from the cash receipts budget. Our inventory, that'll take a little bit of work, and we'll do that in a moment. Our fixed assets and our accumulated depreciation will roll from our 1231 balance sheet, as will our debt and stock. Our retained earnings will need the income statement to be completed before we can fill that in. So let's do the income statement first. 
We know that we sold 240,000 units during the quarter, and at 50 cents each, we're at $120,000 of revenue. Our cost of goods will also be based on that 240,000 units of sales. We know that each unit requires 6 cents of raw materials and 2 cents of overhead, which gives us a total of 8 cents per unit. And when we take our 240,000 multiplied by our 8 cents a unit, we get $19,200. We then add in our labor at a rate of 9 bucks per 200 units, and that's another $10,800 of cost of goods sold, totaling $30,000. Our gross profit is now 90 grand. We've got all the other expenses we recognized on the overhead budget, such as depreciation, sales salaries, and the like, and those total $21,500 for the quarter, giving us operating income of $68,500. Subtract out that interest expense of 140 and we get our net income of $68,360. That wasn't so hard. Okay, so now we have to do that inventory thing. We're going to have both raw materials and finished goods, so let's do each of them. We look to our materials budget to see that we're going to end with 22,500 ounces of flour, 7,500 ounces of sugar, and 22,500 ounces of sprinkles at 1, 2, and 1 cent respectively. When we add all this up, there's $600 of inventory. For our finished goods, we're going to do the same thing we did with our cost of goods sold in the income statement. We've got ending inventory of 3,750 units, and these cost us six cents each in direct materials, two cents in applied overhead, and then there's that direct labor at nine bucks per 200 units, and if we add all that good stuff up, we get the total finished goods of $469 and an ending total inventory of 1,069. Now we can do the balance sheet. Please verify that you can duplicate those numbers and you understand where they all come from. Cash comes from our cash budget, 26263 Our accounts receivable is what's left of the March sales that weren't collected, which is 10500 We just calculated inventory as being 1069 Our fixed assets have increased from 250000 to 310000 and our accumulated depreciation has increased by $8,000 to $83,000, giving us total assets of $264,832. On the liability side, our debt and stock is unchanged, and when we take a look at our retained earnings, it rolls forward by adding net income to our beginning balance, and we get 264832 here again. Pretty cool, huh? So there's our financial statements. Now, we look at those and see if that's where we really want to be on March 31st. If it is, then huzzah! If not, then we have to go back and see what we can do with our operations that put us in a better place. Now there are a couple of other budgeting things to talk about. First is the idea of the rolling budget. If you recall, way back when in Chapter 2, we talked about the periodicity assumption, that we've carved the life of the firm into discrete chunks, and that's how we do our reporting. From a real-time management standpoint, though, it's dangerous to get in that sort of a rut. As we go through the period, it's important to keep the budget up to date for any changes in the business environment. Let's say that we discovered midway through the year that our cash collections aren't on that 70-30 pattern. Leaving the budget with that assumption in there kind of ruins the whole thing. Or our cost inputs change. We should update for that. As each month passes, we should predict out one month further so that we've always got the next 12 months planned out based on the newest information that we have. That's the idea behind the rolling budget. We always have the following X months planned out ahead of us. That's not to say that we completely ignore the original budgeted amount as a benchmark for our performance, but from a control standpoint, if we've got information that we know is out of date, we should adjust for it for planning purposes. Further, let's say that for some reason the budget has been totally blown out of the water. The target we've asked managers to achieve is so far out of reach that there's no chance they're going to make it, or we're halfway through the year and they're 90% of the way there. In either of these two cases, how hard do you think managers are going to work the remaining six months? Probably not as hard as we'd like them to. Either they're not going to make their target no matter what they do, or they could hit their target only working one day a week. In either case, the budget becomes a meaningless number for the manager. This rolling budget allows us to maintain employee focus during the entire budgetary cycle. 
The other half of this chapter relates to variances. Our budget is going to be wrong. The best laid plans are going to go awry, at least by a little bit. And so here we are at the end of the month, and we look back at what happened, and we say to ourselves, wow, that's not quite what I was expecting it to be. So what happened? Well, one of two things were wrong. Either we totally blew the estimates, our engineers screwed up their calculations, and said we'd need 10 hours of labor to make a product, and it turns out that we actually only needed 8, or we needed 12. Or, were the estimates correct, but some outside force screwed things up on us? For instance, some jackass blows up an oil rig in the Gulf, and that caused the price of the mussels that we buy to spike by 20%. Or, perhaps someone fell asleep on the assembly line, and so all of the product that went past their workstation had to be re to be finished. So to continue the example we were using of the donut hole company, we stated that we could produce 200 donut holes per hour of direct labor, and so given the output of any period, we should know pretty close to exactly what our labor costs are going to be. Or, we know that we use 3 ounces of flour, 1 ounce of sugar, and 1 ounce of sprinkles on our donut holes. And so, given our inventory of raw materials, our purchases, and our production, we should be able to estimate ending inventory with reasonable precision. But that's all based on the estimates, and something could have happened. So when we see the difference between the actual and the expected, we need to go in and figure out why it was that this happened. There are two dimensions on which our production can be out of whack, either labor or materials. Let's start with the material variance first. The cost of the materials we used were either higher or lower than what we thought they were going to be. So let's say we expected to use a thousand units of material at a buck each, which means we thought we'd use a thousand dollars of inventory in production. And it turns out we actually spent 1210. Well, what happened? It looks like we used 1,100 units of inventory, 100 more than we expected to use, and we ended up paying $1.10 for that material instead of the dollar we budgeted. Well, crap. This materials variance of $210 can be broken up into two chunks, quantity and price. The price variance is calculated as the actual units we used multiplied by the difference in price between expected and actual. So we have 100 units times a dime per unit gives us $110. That's the part of the variance that is due to our cost of materials being higher than expected. So we go and investigate the reason for the price spike. Did our purchasing manager blow it, or was there a shock to the system and we just went along for the ride? The material quantity variance is the standard price of a buck times the quantity difference, which in this case is 100 units. So our variance is 100 bucks. This is money that would have gone over budget even if the price hadn't changed. Was there greater waste than expected? Perhaps people just out and out stole from us. Together, these two explain the $210 difference, but are very different sources of variation. We'll follow up with both of these variances and determine whether we think that it was a one-time event or if we should reset our baseline estimates. And if we think we need to reset those estimates, we're going to have to go back and do our budgeting from scratch, including our break-even analysis to determine how the company should react. Now, it's important to investigate variances regardless of in which direction the variance falls. Up above, we had two examples of cost overruns. But cost shortfalls can be just as bad. Because what if our engineers really believe it's going to cost us X to produce the product, and we came in under that? Well, it's possible our engineers are idiots, but it's possible that they were exactly right. And in what cases would we determine that a favorable variance was actually a bad thing? Well, say we've got a favorable price variance. When would this be bad? Perhaps if our purchasing manager purchased lower quality product to shave a couple bucks off the price. In some cases, this wouldn't be so bad. But what if we're building a bridge, or an airplane, or soldier combat armor? Substandard raw materials may result in a faulty product, and that's not so good. What about a bad favorable quantity variance? We used less than we had budgeted. Maybe we made those donut holes with only 90% of the expected flour, sugar, and sprinkles. What does this mean? Our premium gourmet donut holes now look more like our competitors, eroding our brand value. Or maybe we only used three screws to assemble a product, instead of the five the engineers designed for. There will be increased warranty claims, for sure. Let's turn to labor variances. We can do the exact same thing we did with materials. We're going to look at the quantity we consumed and the cost of those quantities and see how we did. We expected to use 100 hours of labor at 8 bucks per hour, and we actually used 90 hours at 9. 
The total variance is only 10 bucks, but it's composed of two parts. So it's not a good idea to ignore it, since that $10 variance could be the netting of two substantial variances. The first is our labor rate variance, which is the equivalent of the material price variance. We take the actual quantity of labor and multiply it by the difference in price. In this case, 90 hours times a buck an hour, so our labor rate variance is $90. We're paying our employees more per hour for the work that they did. On the labor efficiency variance, we find that we saved money, 80 bucks, because our employees were able to complete the desired work with fewer hours on the floor. Each of those would be something worth investigating, though together they net to a trivial amount. Again, this could be a one-time event, or it could represent a systemic change in our production. That labor rate variance. Did we have to hire a temp at higher wages because some of our employees were out sick? Or did we just sign a new union contract that increased their wages long term? One's going to require adaptation to our budgets going forward, one probably not. And again, it's possible for us to have favorable labor variances that are actually detrimental to our business. Let's say we have a favorable labor rate variance. We are paying our employees less per hour than we had planned. Perhaps that means we lost some veteran workers and had to hire newbie replacements. We might see greater incidents of faulty products that are returned for warranty work, or are simply scrapped off the assembly line. Or, less skilled workers may mean that the project takes longer to complete. And if we're a subcontractor, that means we might get fined by the general for late completion. Let's say we have a favorable labor quantity variance. The employees did the work in less time than we expected. It's possible that our employees just discovered a quicker way to do the work, and if so, that's awesome. But maybe it's not so good. If we're an accounting firm, maybe this means that the audit team didn't bother auditing the liability side of the balance sheet. That would sure save some time. Or, as what happened with my lovely Indiana house, maybe they put up the eaves using only finishing nails rather than the big honkin' jobbies that stick really well. And so the very first ice storm we had ripped them off from the side of the house. So there's budgeting and variances for you. Assignment 3 is similar to the budget process we just went through, including creating a set of financial statements. Though I have spared you the pain of a manufacturing firm, so you don't have to worry about all that crazy inventory stuff that we went through. It's available for you to get started on now.